Today on Ag Etc, do meat alternatives hurt the cattle industry? The answer might surprise you. We head to High Plain Journal's Cattle U to get the answer. Learn what management practices you can implement in your operation to increase the efficiency of rainfall. K-State's Dr. Michaud heads to an early wheat field to explain what insects you should find. Learn what certified Angus beef means for the producer and the consumer. And officers go to hemp school. It's all coming up on Ag Etc. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. My name is Karen Cope and I have multiple sclerosis. When you have MS, on the outside you look great, but you know what's really going on in the inside is chronic body pain, chronic fatigue. And there's lots of days that I'd wake up and say, well, please God, help me get through this day. You know, after stem cells, Chloe, my youngest daughter, she was asked by my father-in-law, how's your mom doing? And Chloe said, uh, Grandpa, I've never had a mom like this before because she was eight when I was diagnosed and she really had no other memory of me but being sick. It's really the simple things that we do as a family, like play cards and, and to be able to win at cards, you know, they all laugh because I used to repeat myself and say, what hand are we on? You know, what's, where are we at? And it's just been really a, a true blessing from God and we're, we're really thankful. Imagine turning soybean oil, used cooking oils, and waste animal fats into fuel so amazing it drives U.S. jobs and our economy forward. Learn more about biodiesel at americasadvancedbiofuel.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center. Your stem cells, your health, your life. Hi, I'm Lee Leachman. And I had the opportunity today to open up Cattle U here in Dodge City, Kansas. And uh, the focus of my talk was talking about the future of the beef cattle industry. There was an article that came out on Outdoor Online, and it said that the uh, future of the cattle industry doesn't look good because of all this alt product that's out there, the alternative meat burgers. And uh, I, I was just talking to the cattle people here today about the idea that our industry actually has tons of potential. In fact, I think the sun is rising, not setting on our industry, because we've got all kinds of opportunities to use technology to improve our industry. So I talked about advanced reproductive technologies that allow us to take the very best animals and multiply them. I talked about genomically enhanced DPDs, which allow us to better know which animals are truly the best at the lifetime of traits that we're concerned about. I talked about databases that we need to collect to measure all these kind of traits like animal health and uh, lifetime fertility and some of the traits that we don't know much about yet on our beef cattle. And then I talked about indexes or dollar values that put all that together that really indicate to us which animals make the most money. Because at the end of the day, we don't want any of those traits. We want to find the animals that make the most money from birth to harvest. And we talked about the idea that that would be something that would then be available for commercial herds to use for their own selection and then segued into managing the cattle through the feedlot with more precision so that we actually harvested animals at the optimal time. We, we knew what they were gaining, we knew what they were converting, we knew what was happening on a carcass basis, and we could actually predict all that and come up with a value function. And finally, today there's more integration really coordination of the supply chain than there's ever been before. And I think that's a great opportunity. We're going to be able to meet more and more niche consumer needs. We're going to deliver our beef product to exactly who's willing to pay the most for it. And that's going to create more value. And so I see as we put all this technology together that we're going to be able to create an industry that's more responsive to consumer needs, that's more cost effective, that does a better job producing a high quality product. And for me, that's really important. I mean, we're in the United States. We don't have the cheapest cost of production relative to global producers of beef. So we don't want to produce a commodity product. We want to differentiate ourselves to the maximum potential and really provide the consumer with exactly what they're willing to pay for. If they want more traceability, I think we give them traceability if it adds value to our operations. If they want a certain kind of animal or a certain way it's produced, 
uh, a high quality beef. I'm a real believer that that product has to eat well because consumers are gonna pay for that eating experience in beef. I mean, after all, we're not chicken, we're beef. And, and our uniqueness is in our flavor profile that comes from the fat that's in that marbling. And so we want high marbled beef. And I think the potential today is to produce high marbled beef, to do it efficiently, to really maximize or optimize all those traits across the production system. And by doing that, I think we can add several hundred dollars of value to our animals. And I think that's why I'm so excited about being in the beef cattle industry today. Join us for the 15th annual Fall Bull Sale at Gardner Angus Ranch, Monday, September 30th at 9 a.m., featuring approximately 450 registered bulls, 160 registered females, including 35 cows and 125 heifers, and 300 bred commercial females. These are elite herd sire prospects and rank in the top percentiles of the Angus breed for calving ease, growth, and end product merit. Catalog will be available at GardnerAngus.com. Register for online bidding at LiveAuction.tv. It's business as usual producing value-added seed stock that provides opportunities for profitability regardless of our customer's chosen marketing endpoint. See you in September at the ranch. Kim Mannering with Hardy Insurance. Today we will talk about umbrella coverage. Did you know that if you're held liable in any type of accident, the judgment can claim your assets? Please give me a call so we can discuss 316-945-6733. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Supply. This segment brought to you by SureCrop. Liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. I'm an agronomist for Green Cover Seed, and uh, I have a little small cattle ranch. And what I spoke about today was uh, how to create a drought resilient soil. I mean, throughout history, we have uh, thought that when it didn't rain, our only possible recourse was to, you know, just pray and hope for better, hope for rain. Uh, we're since finding out that there are hundreds if not thousands of management techniques that we can use to increase the efficiency of the rainfall we do get. Um, you know, rain that falls on concrete doesn't, doesn't do any good. Rain that falls onto a soil that absorbs it, it is effective. And so essentially what, um, what I spoke about were, were all these techniques. Uh, they're all outlined in my book, The Drought Resilient Farm, and we talk about methods to increase the infiltration of rainfall into the soil, how to increase the water holding capacity of the soil, reduce evaporation, and how to increase, uh, increase the rooting depth of our crops and the efficiency with which crops take up water. And then also uh, talk about uh, how to provide uh, livestock drinking water in a drought, how to um, make your pastures more resistant to drought so that animals don't run out of feed. And then how do we change our cropping systems so that uh, we're less susceptible to drought? You know, how do we make a cropping system that when it gets dry, it doesn't matter. We're, we're more resilient that way. The best way to improve soil is to grow more plant material and churn it through the soil. So that's where cover crops come in. You know, we don't have enough growing season most years to grow two grain crops. So you grow a, a grain crop and a cover crop uh, that will never reach, you know, seed maturity. Um, but that not reaching seed maturity thing is really kind of key. The, uh, that means it's going to be in a high protein stage. Instead of mature, it'll be immature. It's high in protein because there's soil organisms that, that fix soil and make it better they need protein. I mean, just like when you feed, feeding the soil is a lot like feeding livestock. They need protein, they need energy, they need minerals. So do soil microbes. And, and cattle, when you feed a cow, 
you're actually feeding the microbes in the rumen. You don't feed the cow itself. You feed the microbes, the microbes feed the cow. Same thing in the soil. If you get around the idea that you're fertilizing plants or you're nourishing plants and realize that everything that you put on the soil goes through a microbe before it gets to the plant, you will overcome a lot of mental barriers to soil improvement when you make that realization. Feed those microbes in the soil just like you feed the microbes in a rumen, and it's the same process. So the idea behind the livestock, number one, they cash flow the cover crops. They pay for the cover crops. So any soil improvement you get is just a great byproduct of feeding your livestock. The other thing that happens is in order for microbes to do their work, it needs to be warm, it needs to be moist, it needs to protect, be protected from ultraviolet light, and it has to be the high protein and low protein material needs to be mixed together. Well, wouldn't it be great if we had a machine that could take low protein crop residue and high protein cover crops, mash them together, moisten them, protect them from ultraviolet light, and keep them dark, and keep them warm, and have a big fermentation chamber and then deposit it out on the ground. Well, we do have a machine. It's called a cow that does all those things. You get more active microbial growth in a cow in 48 hours than you get on the soil surface in a year. There's really two things you do to reduce evaporation. One is to reduce the wind speed at the soil surface. So anything that slows the velocity of wind. You know, wind breaks of trees, we used to have wind breaks around every field. Now people are bulldozing them out at major expense to gain little small tiny pieces of land. And then their entire field has a higher evaporation rate. So in a dry year, your yield goes down. I mean, research has proven wind breaks increase your whole farm yields. Um, leaving your crop residue taller reduces wind speed. Um, there's uh, quite a bit of evidence that harvesting wheat with a stripper header versus a platform header that cuts it really increases the amount of soil moisture that stays in your soil from year to year. Um, and then just having a mulch. Uh, there's been research done at Garden City, Kansas, K-State, where they had complete soil coverage from just one cover crop. They left the residue in place versus removed the residue. There was a difference of five inches of soil moisture throughout a year. That's big. That's an extra 50 bushels, roughly, of dry land corn. What if sustainability were synonymous with U.S. soy? If energy efficiency, water quality, and soil health help define U.S. soy's value, that future is here, the time is now. To meet end-user demands, the Soybean Checkoff is committing to sustainability that's achievable, worthwhile, and enduring. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Fort Wallace was the fightingest fort in the West. Fossils, Indians, soldiers, scouts, wagons, trails, pioneers, stories. Discover the story of Fort Wallace and the people who served here, the people who fought here, the people who settled here. Wallace County, where the past is present. You don't have to be a farmer or rancher to become a Kansas Farm Bureau member. Anyone can join. As a member, you'll get discounts on things like hotels and entertainment, health and wellness services, cell phone plans, and more. You'll also strengthen the lives of your fellow Kansans and help build strong, prosperous communities through agriculture advocacy and education. Join us today. Visit kfb.org slash join to learn more. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or for more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. We're here in the performance test. So we've got different varieties of wheat. Some is late boot, but some, as you can see, is already heading out. And so we're going to sweep a little bit and see what we can find. And so 
the thing to remember when sweeping is you want to standardize your effort your sampling effort that means you do a standard number like i do 10 sweeps and then i check 10 sweeps and check so that way when you go to different fields you get an idea of any regional variation in abundance of these insects so let's see what 10 sweep gets us here so we got some little spiders cursorial spiders there he goes Whoop. that'd that. be a linophyid if you can see him of course, they're trying to get away. <laughs> and I had a little jumping spider in there. So spiders always like to see spiders. Because spiders tell us we got uh, some, some uh, biological diversity. They're generalist predators. So we got a little plant hopper and we got some aphids, two kinds of aphids. And of course, our old friend, Hippodamia convergens. So we gotta get the hand lens out to see what kind of aphids we've got. But you can see there's some black ones there with wings. So those are probably recent immigrants. Those are bird cherry old aphid, Ropalus and patty. And right next to that, we have a big fat green bug. So we do have green bugs. And we have English green aphid, which looks a lot like a green bug, but has a lot longer tailpipes, cor cornicles in the back. And this, is just a little micro lepidoptera <laughs> feeding on the wheat. So, um, not that much really. I was hoping for some more generalist predators, but we'll give it another shot, maybe over here. Ah, there's a friend. So that's a damsel bug, Nabus americoferus. And he's hanging around, he's about to take flight. You can probably get that there. So a wonderful generalist predator. He's got piercing sucking mouth parts like all predatory bugs. He'll prey on small insect eggs, maybe baby caterpillars, aphids, anything soft bodied and small, juvenile leaf hoppers. And of course, Colea megala maculata, the 12 spotted lady beetle, the little pink one. There he goes. So that's good. There's another damsel bug. So these are signs that we've got some aphids and there's another sign we got some aphids. Because that little guy there is Lysiphlebus, our number one parasitoid of grain aphids. And a big old stink bug, so we don't want him. We should be fortunate that our stink bugs are not a problem in ripening wheat. There are some shield bugs in Asia that are amongst the most devastating pests of wheat in the world. We don't have them here. We don't want them. So we, we came out here just last week and we, did, we, we didn't see this many aphids. So with finally getting some warm weather, we're getting some aphid activity here. It's still kind of 10 days behind normal, what you'd expect at this time of year. And there's a little surfid fly, hoverfly. So um, there's just enough aphids now to be really attracting the natural enemies. Normally this would have happened a couple of weeks ago if we hadn't had such cold spring weather. And so the aphids are really just getting started and I'm expecting if we come out in another week, we'll probably see a, little, a greater variety of, of natural enemies. But that's what we're hoping for. Uh, some aphids in the wheat is a good thing because this is where all our natural enemies have their first generation of the year. They need something to eat. So they're all, they're all multiplying their numbers and the same beneficial insects are going to leave the wheat at maturity and distribute to other uh, habitats and hopefully uh, contribute to some biological control in our summer crop. Welcome to the Western Kansas Wildlife Travel Center right here in my hometown of Oakley, Kansas. We're the front door of Western Kansas located on three main highways, I-70, US-83, and US-40. And all those roads lead to history, beautiful scenery, and adventure no matter which direction you go. We now have an IHOP that brand that you've trusted up and down the road in all your travels is staffed with local folks, real people, just like you and me, and we're waiting on you to join us. So for fun, adventure, fuel up, fuel your body, and let's have some fun.
Hello, I'm Dr. Frank Lyons from Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center here in Manhattan, Kansas. Daryl was one of our patients that we did about seven months ago. I dug trees by hand for years and years and years. In the process, I wore out my rotary cuff. But when I learned about this process, I thought if there was a way to get rid of this pain, then I, then I wanted to do it. So we did it and it worked. I'm not going to go out and take trees with a shovel anymore, but, but I can do the things that I want to do now. Well, it's been very gratifying to help people with their painful joints and other uh, entities, and it's been especially gratifying to be able to help people who I know and have worked with and known for many years. This segment brought to you by Santa Fe Trail Meats in Overbrook. Let us help feed your family. Luke Mason runs an Angus farm with his family in north central Tennessee. But he took a few days off during springtime to see what's going on in the broader beef industry. My family has a Angus registered and commercial operation. We run about 100 registered cows and about 300 commercial cows. Yeah, BLI is a uh, been very educational. Uh, didn't know what I was getting into, uh, but learning all of what the Angus Association does, then moving on to uh, out in the field and getting to go to a feed yard, a packing plant, Transova, and then coming here to CAB, uh, really, really cool. Impressed by so many working for the brand he owns, the young cattleman resolved to bring lessons home. Here at CAB, uh, just an amazing facility. Uh, the research and uh, uh, the men and women here that put a lot of, a lot of time and dedication into this uh, to make a better product for us consumers. I'm gonna look for CAB in uh, the stores and uh, restaurants and help other producers genetically improve their cattle herd. The family has been building up carcass merit in their herd for the past five years, retaining ownership of calves for the first time this year. Pounds pay, but quality pounds pay more. And that was what we were trying to increase our marbling. And from doing that, we our cattle sold two years in a row, uh, the highest at the on the video board. And we thought, well, we should keep our cattle and retain ownership. And uh, we... We shipped them out in January uh, to Tiffany's Cattle Company in Kansas. Excited about a first load harvested in June with above average numbers accepted for the certified Angus beef brand. Mason says they'll keep improving and bring others along. Getting into the retained ownership was something new for us. Uh, no one in our area has done it uh, or at least currently doing it. So we kind of branched out and people's asked a lot of questions. And by getting that carcass data back and knowing how our cattle's performed in the feed yard, average daily gain, all the way through the what they graded, uh, we were able to share that with our customers and our friends around home. And hopefully we can help mentor them into more of us retaining ownership and benefiting the breed. I'm Bob Cervera. Kansas Corn reminds you that E15 fuel is the right choice for every kind of driver. For the car enthusiast, E15 has higher octane. For the thrifty driver, E15 is priced lower than regular unleaded. For the nature lover, E15 provides cleaner air. For the shopper who buys local, E15 has more ethanol from our Kansas Corn Farms. Choose E15 for a higher octane, lower price, cleaner American fuel. Message from the Kansas Corn Commission. Learn more at kscorn.com. Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas. 
We work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need, and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's, that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're, we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but yeah, we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is surecropfertilizers.com. And you can always email me at corey at surecropfertilizers.com. And with any questions you have, we'd be glad to answer and work with you. This segment brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff. Progress powered by Kansas farmers. We're in our first year of industrial hemp research and we have been reaching out to farmers, we've been reaching out to growers, but we realize one of the groups of people who have to deal with hemp that we haven't reached out to yet is law enforcement. So we had a field day for law enforcement today and the Kansas Department of Agriculture here, was here as well to talk about the rules and the regulations. We toured the research plots to kind of show them what an industrial hemp farm would look like, what a grain plot looks like, and what a CBD plot looks like. Um, we had lots of great questions, lots of back and forth, and it was, it was all in all it was a really successful day. Law enforcement's involvement um, with industrial hemp will um, exceedingly grow as um, this crop becomes commercialized in Kansas. These outreach events um, are kind of bridging the gap between those that are involved with the program and law enforcement that may potentially um, get involved with um, questions that they have about what's required for licensees um, to have on themselves when they're transporting industrial hemp. Um, what should I be looking for to ensure that someone's conducting activities that they're legally allowed to um, conduct. Their involvement with potentially um, criminal investigations and making the distinction between um, industrial hemp and cannabis is going to be extremely crucial. So um, this educational outreach event um, is a building block for those in law enforcement to understand how it grows and um, making it into an industrial hemp product. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com. Join us for the 15th annual Fall Bull Sale at Gardner Angus Ranch, Monday, September 30th at 9 a.m. Featuring approximately 450 registered bulls, 160 registered females, including 35 cows and 125 heifers, and 300 bred commercial females. These are elite herd sire prospects and rank in the top percentiles of the Angus breed for calving ease, growth, and end product merit. Catalog will be available at GardnerAngus.com. Register for online bidding at LiveAuction.tv. It's business as usual producing value-added seed stock that provides opportunities for profitability regardless of our customer's chosen marketing endpoint. See you in September at the ranch. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. 